Hello, and welcome to another episode of our Outlier Investor Series, where we dig into the ideas, frameworks, and strategies used by world-renowned investors across public and private markets. I'm Daniel Scribner, and on the show today, I'm joined again by Robert Cantwell, founder of Upholdings and portfolio manager of Compound Kings, which is an exchange-traded fund focused on investing in companies called Compounders, because they're reinvesting all the returns they're getting in their business into the highest ROIC areas of their business. I had Robert Cantwell on last year in episode number 23, where he joined me shortly after launching Compound Kings in late 2020. This is an incredible interview with a true pioneer in the actively managed ETF space. In it, we look back at the top three positions in Compound Kings when Robert and I sat down in early 2021, which feels like a world away, to review the performance of Alibaba, Meta, then Facebook, and Berkshire Hathaway. Robert shares his perspective on how the actively managed ETF market is shaping up, and he talks about how his views on concentrations have changed over the last year and a half. We talk about the rise of thematic funds and where they can go wrong. Robert shares the three biggest learnings from the last 18 months, including why you always have to be learning new industries, why you should add a quant to your investment team, and why knowing the people running public companies matters a lot. Robert walks through his team's thesis on the three largest positions in the fund today, which include Meta, ServiceNow, and Adyen. This section of the interview is fantastic, so skip ahead and don't miss it if you're short on time. And finally, Robert shares what it's like to build an ETF business, scale assets under management, and why running an investment business is very similar to an enterprise software business. You can find the show notes and text transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 129. That's outlieracademy.com slash 129. And you can learn more about Compound Kings at kingsetf.com or by following Robert Cantwell at Upholdings on Twitter. Please enjoy my conversation with Robert Cantwell of Compound Kings. Robert Cantwell, I am so excited to have you back on Outlier Academy as part of our Outlier Investors series. Thank you so much for coming back on. Daniel, great to be back on Outliers again. So, you know, to start, uh, I'm sure a lot of people listening might remember, but we talked 18 months ago in episode 23, shortly after you launched Compound Kings, and it was one of my favorite conversations at the time. I'm thrilled to have you back. Where I wanted to start was for people that are listening and hearing about Compound Kings for the first time, can you just tee up what Compound Kings is, how you invest, and how you invest differently? Absolutely. And we, we found that it's easiest to start by describing what it's not. Because in the retail investment management industry, most strategies get thrown into a growth bucket or a value bucket, and compounders are are really not quite either of those. And so in a growth strategy, you're trying to buy the maximum amount of growth for the cheapest price. In a value strategy, you're trying to buy the most amount of the balance sheet or the most amount of cash flow for the smallest multiple. And in compounder investing, what you're trying to do is pursue opportunities where the businesses are allocating capital in a very high return on investment manner. And then the question is, how can I acquire that high return on investment spending for the best possible price? So that could be a company that's a a duopoly that's pursuing M&A and all of a sudden it's going to look like a monopoly after. It could be a more growth-driven business that has launched a new distribution channel that's going to unlock a lot of incremental revenue at a relatively low cost of the business. So there's a lot of different ways that return on investment can manifest itself. One other wrinkle that, that will, is worth mentioning here is the importance of active share, uh, which is emerging as a, a more and more commonly accepted variable uh, for investors that are selecting amongst investment managers. And what active share is, it's not just your performance against your benchmark. It's also how different are you against your benchmark? Because the the majority of uh, investors already have S&P 500 exposure or Russell 2000 exposure. So if your benchmark is the S&P 500, they want to know that the holdings or the weightings that you're carrying, as well as the additional stocks that you're holding that might not be in the S&P, how different is that than the S&P? And so you know, our fund, for example, we, we run it at an 86% active share. And that's been one of the important differentiators for us in running our strategy. Just really quickly, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I'm curious, 
you know, do when you're talking with people, and this could be financial advisors, this could be, uh, you know, wholesalers, uh, this could be individual investors, like on public.com, about compounding and compounders, do you feel like you have to explain and kind of take people from zero to one on what that is? Or is there short, a shorthand way with which you kind of get people to understand what a compounder is? Or is that knowledge kind of kind of there? I'd say it's half and half. So half the time we don't. They understand they've read Buffett or they've read you know some other investment materials. And the other half of the circumstances where we do have to talk about it can get confused with compound interest. And they think we're selling a, a dividend fund or something of that nature. And in those cases, what we've found as the simplest way of describing the types of companies that we seek is pursuing the longest duration businesses possible. So what is it about the characteristics of the business that are going to allow it to survive market cycles, even if it has somewhat volatile cash flow characteristics throughout those periods? And we found that that duration component is something that's really interesting to a lot of folks because companies come in and out of the S&P 500 all the time. Companies come in and out of other funds. And the idea of holding this set of securities that has a better chance of surviving you know, a decade or two decades is something that they've found to be uh, an interesting angle. Yeah, that makes sense. And it seems very differentiated. I, I, I want to talk in a second um, to touch on a couple of the points that we hit on in the last interview and talk about deltas, you know, how your thinking has changed over the last 18 months. But I want to start, you know, as I was preparing for this interview, kind of reflecting back, uh, you know, my take is that the last 18 months have been incredibly volatile. <laughs> we've had we've had a global pandemic. Uh, you know, recently we've had a, a, a war and a lot of international tensions with, with China and with Russia. Um, you know, we've had meme stocks. We've had SPACs. What is your sense of the last two years and how has Compound King survived? How have you survived? The last two years has been more challenging for investment managers than many other two-year periods in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, there's a reason why there's a lot of comparisons to 2008 drawdowns. Interestingly, there has not been the same deterioration in fundamentals in this market sell-off that we've experienced. And so it's been harder because valuation multiples have changed faster, in large part because that 10-year interest rate has finally started to, to move up, something that the Fed has struggled to, to push up in uh, previous raising cycles. And so that's been a confusing environment for investors because they're sitting here and saying, well, gosh, our, our companies are still performing, but their stock prices aren't. And how do I reconcile that? And this, is, this then gets back to a lot about how you're building your investment company. And if your investment model itself is not built to survive cycles of market prices that can be divorced from fundamentals, that's when you get into a lot of trouble. Either you know, you're taking on too much leverage or you have investors that have the ability to withdraw really quickly or investors that you know, think you're starting to do something different than, than what you promised them in the first place. So I think that's been some of the biggest uh, learnings and observations that we've seen from this environment is which investors actually built their companies to deal with circumstances like this as opposed to those that are always trying to pursue the, the shortest maximum rate of return. Yeah, it's very well said. I want to talk about concentration for a moment. You know, one of the things that you spoke about in our first interview, which is episode 23 again, uh, and we'll link to it in the show notes so people can listen to that as well, uh, was concentration and this idea of having a fund that could be more concentrated. You know, you gave, a, I think, a number at the time of, and I don't think there's any positions at the time that were this large, but that you would be comfortable with a position maybe going to 15 to 20 percent. And so I just wanted to kind of talk about um, concentration at a high level. And one, I guess the two questions would be, has your thinking changed at all? And how do you guys approach concentration today, if any differently? Our thinking has evolved quite a bit on this topic. Thanks for, thanks for bringing this one up again. And this is part of being an emerging fund manager. How much do you know at the outset versus what you what you learn along the way? And it's I'll actually you know step back and, and talk for a moment here about the transition from being um, a, an equity analyst into a portfolio manager is it's not an immediate process. And you know when you're an analyst that's making recommendations, you're typically only really into three or four at the most, you know, given opportunities at a time. 
And, you know, the way in which, you know, my own personal investments had been managed, I, I personally never held more than three or four, you know, securities at a time. And th- that type of history is what drove that sort of level of over-concentration. And it was one of the things we experimented with early on in our fund. We're going to talk more about this as we get into it later. But one of the biggest things we added was a quantitative analyst to our team. And this is someone that is much less stubborn about any single security uh, but does a tremendous amount of work comparing you know, securities in the market and understanding volatility and risk profiles of different investments. And one of the studies that we did was you know, looking at our universe of companies that we've loved and you know, going back over the last 20 years and testing different weighting strategies, equal weighting, market cap weighting, valuation multiple rating, conviction weighting. And one of the interesting things that we found was that all of the different weighting methodologies kind of got you to the same ending point with different volatility characteristics along the way. So this was a huge you know, eye opener for us because it meant that we didn't have to plow 15 or 20 percent of the fund into a single security. And it meant that over time, we could sort of push ourselves not to be purely equal weighted, but to put bands on the conviction levels. And so we're, for the most part, keeping our largest positions a bit under 10 percent, but we're also pushing up the floor and not owning, you know, less than one to one and a half percent of anything. Yeah. Just on that note, you know, previously, did you hold positions in very small amounts? And I guess the reason I'm curious about that is the idea of having a floor seems really interesting because, you know, in investing, oftentimes you'll hear investors talk about a toehold and there's no real, I don't know, I've never heard a quantitative answer around how big a toehold position is, but you'll go and look at a lot of funds and you'll see positions that are 0.1, 0.05, you know, 0.05, a very, very, very small number. Talk a little bit about how you got to that floor and maybe what the floor was before, if that was different. Yeah, the, I mean, the floor is even smaller before. Value Act had a good answer on this, which is, you know, we use our smallest positions as a, uh, as a research trigger. So if someone cares enough about something that they keep bringing it up, we throw it in the fund, you know, pretty darn quickly as one of our smallest positions. And that puts a lot of pressure on the research team to justify the existence of that position and resultingly try to argue that it ought to be a bigger position in the portfolio. Uh, because unless something is in the portfolio, really no one you know, around the table takes it, takes it very seriously. So that, that floor has walked up. I mean, it used to, we used to have a handful of you know, 50 basis point positions was, was our smallest example. And the, the truth is that those positions don't drive a fund. And well, I would say that we, we manage ourselves more towards the 25 security max. Anytime we start drifting more than 25 securities, we find that the, the research and conviction gets, gets stretched too uh, thinly. But these have all been factors in, in driving the, the top and bottom uh, sizing in the portfolio. I'm going to ask one more question on that, and then I'll move on. I want to talk about the state of active management and ETFs. You know, I, I guess flipping to the other side of the portfolio, you talked about 25 max positions. You know, uh, another stat that a lot of investors will talk about is generally their top 10 positions and how much weight in the fund those have. What are your thoughts? What are What is your approach to managing your highest conviction uh, positions? And are those 10? Are those 15? Does the number move around? And then what's that total weight look like? Sure. Well, there's one requirement in, in running a, a 40s Act fund, which is your, your larger than 5% positions can't make up more than 50% of the fund. And so what that means for us is concentrating into our you know, highest conviction ideas means that we have about six securities that make up the top 50% of the fund. That number may vary from six to eight, uh, you know, depending on, on, how, um, on how much we're moving it. But I think it's critical. This I mentioned the, the active share component earlier. It is incredibly difficult to get your active share above 60, 70%. Anything below 70%, you're closet indexing. So as a result, it is very challenging to get to that level of active share without having that level of concentration in your top six to eight positions. So we view that as, as, as table stakes for you know, getting to be a, a competitive uh, active fund. Thanks for sharing that. I, I want to talk for a second about active management. You know, one of the things you talked about in our last interview was, uh, you know, that you felt like there was going to be a wave of active managers entering the space. Has that happened? Give us uh, the state of the active managed kind of ETF market. It is. Yeah, it is Wild West. There is, uh, 
the money's the money is coming and it's coming in fast. So at the, as of the end of last year, you had about three hundred billion dollars in actively managed ETFs. That was up from two hundred billion a year before that. So a hundred billion dollars of capital flowing into a fifty percent growth in a single uh, vehicle of investment is awfully awfully fast, and it does not appear to be slowing. So if you were to look today at ETF launches, it has now in fact become easier to launch an active ETF than it is to uh, launch a, a traditional index-based ETF. Now, the challenge with that is because the barrier to entry has fallen so low, that means that you've gotten a much wider variety of what is being called an actively managed ETF than what might traditionally be considered an actively managed fund. So in our view, a traditionally active managed fund is this is a benchmark. It is our job to uh, beat that benchmark with as little volatility as possible, and investors can measure us against that. Most of the actively managed ETF air quotes that have come out aren't doing that. They're coming out and saying, hey, we're active because we're also you know, overlaying some option strategy. Uh, and so you've had a lot of um, equity linked income products have been kind of the most popular thing this year. It's hard to see that because investors don't realize the costs that they're assuming in participating in a strategy like that. They don't realize what they're giving up relative to S&P 500 performance in general. Uh, but sometimes those products can sell because you're, you're telling someone, hey, we're going to give you equity returns, plus you're going to get some cash out of it. And that can sound good to an investor, but if they're not doing the hard work of figuring out how that's truly benchmarked about what they could get if they own you know, broad indices, you know, they're losing some of the some of the spread in that entire process. So there's a there's a lot of stuff going on out there. There's conversions. Some of the large mutual fund houses have begun to convert a couple of funds. Vanguard, BlackRock, Capital Group, they're all now officially in the actively managed ETF space. For the most part so far, though, these really large managers, they've they've entered the space, but they're not penetrating it. So with whatever you know funds they brought to it, that, that's sort of where they are right now. And it's probably going to take them a you know, handful of years as it's taken us to figure out how to make the product relevant to the market that they're, uh, they're trying to sell it to. So, but look, it's still really early. I mean, actively managed ETFs are just a little more than 2% of the 12 trillion in actively managed AUM out there. And you know, we see that penetration getting to at least 10% over the next uh, five to seven years. Yeah, two percent is still a very small number. <laughs> uh, you know, we asked uh, both of our followers, kind of leading into this interview, if there's anything they'd like to hear you talk about. And Ben Patton asked the question, uh, which I really like. I'm excited to hear you 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 answer. How is it that mutual funds are still surviving given the low cost of ETFs? What are your thoughts on that? Honestly, the survivability of mutual funds is a huge reason why we got into this business in the first place, uh, which is one of the secrets of the retail investment management industry is that the majority of money that is invested and grown doesn't actually get spent. Most of it ultimately gets uh, handed down or transferred at some point. And so what that means is that money that get, has been allocated to mutual funds, mutual funds have a hundred year head start here on actively managed ETFs. So there is an incredibly long tail of mutual funds that even though they're not winning a ton of new assets into their vehicle, they are still growing with the market faster than their investors are withdrawing from the funds. So there's stuff that's, you know, when you've seen the charts with the hundreds of billions of dollars that have been coming out of mutual funds, you're talking about less than 5% of the AUM of these aggregate vehicles. And that's coming from the, the, the life cycle of an investment where there are retirees that are living off of some of their investments. But as a group, they're not withdrawing quickly enough from the category to that truly uh, shrink the, the market share of mutual funds in a more rapid way. And so what you're doing you know, in this business is you're fighting for where the incremental capital is being allocated. And when we talked about just 2% of the entire active retail uh, equity management industry, 35% of new dollars are going into actively managed ETFs. So you just you have a very large um, uh, dispersion between where the money is already sitting versus where the new money is uh, coming in. 
One of the other things I had to ask you about, you know, in this interview is thematic ETFs. And, you know, thematic ETFs are, can be conflated or, you know, they're, I don't know, they're somewhat related. They can be passively managed, actively managed, um, but they're a little bit different. And, you know, I've heard many takes that thematic ETFs, people think those are going to become a bigger and bigger part of people's portfolios. What are your thoughts on thematic ETFs and how that space may play out? You know, earlier you mentioned that you were asking is 2021 was that peak year of actively managed ETFs. And you actually could categorize 2021 as perhaps the peak year for thematic ETFs. Thematic ETFs were this sort of strange bridge product from traditional index-based ETFs until, you know, now what you're starting to see is actual stock picking investment managers, you know, behind these funds. And ARK is probably the shining example of, of riding that thematic ETF trend. They tried to have a foot in both camps, you know, saying we're active investors, but really what they were doing was, was building these thematic portfolios and saying, you know, you want exposure to genomics, we're going to put this basket of, you know, genome oriented companies together, whether or not they happen to be good investments or not, you know, because that, that's what the actual investor is doing and saying, hey, I, I'm going to target some IRR and, you know, try to at least, you know, meet or exceed that. And that's a very different prerogative than saying, you know, let me give you access to, to this set of type of companies. And to really you know, get into sort of peak thematic, you had, um, uh, gosh, who did it? Roundhill, uh, you know, when they launched that Metaverse ETF, because there were almost two bubbles last year. There was a bubble in February, right around the time we were doing our interview. And then there was that another bubble, you know, in November. What a year. Not <laughs> <laughs> another interview yet. And around that time, that's when the, the Metaverse, you know, ET, ETF launched and it got, you know, a couple hundred million dollars in assets so quickly. But then, you know, Facebook wanted to work through its rebranding to Meta and then offered the Meta ETF folks $10 million just for the ticker. So that's a pretty difficult moment in time to imagine happening again anytime soon and had a lot of the components of things that you might say that was a peak. And so I... We'll see if that was sort of peak for thematic ETFs or not, but it was certainly an incredibly hot year for it. It makes me think of two things. One is, man, Kings, K-N-G-S must be worth a lot of money. So, you know, good job getting that ticker. And then two, you know, on the um, kind of arc thematic note, you know, you and I were joking about this a little bit, but, you know, generally I, I really like that at least in arc you have an investor that's very tech forward because I just think, I mean, I, I think they, there's a lot that they don't do right, but it's nice to have at least some voices kind of making that argument in public markets, um, even if it's messy and all over the place. But one of the things I found kind of darkly comical was looking through things like the space ETF and looking at the positions in that portfolio. Cause you would see things that were very clearly space focused companies, you know, but then it'd be paired up with something like a John Deere tractor that sure, maybe that technology or pieces of it may be important on space or in colonizing Mars or on the moon, but it's a little bit of a stretch to think that that is a true proxy for investing in space. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Well, I'm going to go in a little different direction here. We were talking a little bit about this together before we, before we jumped on this call. And you asked, you know, over the last two years throughout all the volatility, you know, what's your, what's your one bullet point takeaway on the investment uh, business? And, you know, my answer was that the investment management business actually looks a lot more like every other business where there's products, there's marketing, and there's distribution. And you have to be outstanding at all three of those things in order to succeed in this business. And ARC, without question, has been an unbelievable executor in marketing and distribution. And they've released more products than your average investment firm, you know, with easily, you know, getting into the double digits. And so, you know, bringing up something like this, the, that space ETF, I view that as a firm that gets to be really confident in their marketing and distribution because they've done such a great job of building all of these channels directly to individual investors. And they're willing to roll the dice a little bit on products to see, you know, what folks, uh, what might, you know, resonate with people or not. Also, what might actually have some decent short-term market returns because sometimes that can drive the long-term success of a fund or not if it just happens to launch at the right time because it's very difficult to time markets, you know, certainly from that perspective. So I, I throw that more into the experiment bucket for them, you know, with like their transparency ETF and, and other things like that. But again, with names like space and names like transparency, these are themes, 
you know, this isn't saying, you know, compounders is the thing that we're going after. We're going to measure return on invested capital and we're going to buy it for as affordably as we can. We just, it, it's just, we're, we're trying to do something different. Yeah. Very different lenses. You know, I want to come back later in the interview. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, three of the top positions in Compound Kings today and a little bit of depth, but I want to, you know, kind of flash back to our last interview. And um, in the last interview, those three positions that you shared that we talked through were Alibaba, Meta, which was Facebook at the time, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you know, and, and you and I have obviously talked about this kind of off camera before recording about how those played out. Share a little bit of your thoughts on one, just each of those names and, and how they played out and how your thinking has changed since then. We're just reflecting on those. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the first thing I'll say is I'm very happy that I gave such a wide <laughs> range of stocks when we spoke because, gosh, they have had. Uh, awfully, uh, awfully differing paths. Yeah, Baba's down fifty percent, probably a little more than that. Meta's down about thirty percent, and uh, good old Berkshire's up probably about fifteen percent. Warren's Warren's had a great, great year. So, where were we then? Where are we now? I'm thirty eight. I've worked in institutional investment management for eight years, helped build a startup for eight years, and we're working on this business for a few years, and. For the duration of that career, for the most part, China was opening up more and getting along with the US and there were some incredible companies getting built there. And I I had at least preliminarily come to the conclusion that the average American investor had this home bias, which is a well studied thing in the history of investing, which is you invest a lot around your home, but if your home country, but if your home country has its own issues for whatever reason, there's risk to your investment returns. Imagine being our age in Russia, you know, during during a moment like this, you're you you would have wished that you had been diversified outside of that. And I had incorrectly, uh, you know, thought that uh, China would be one of the greatest ways to diversify against you know long term risks to the U.S. economy. And the challenge with all of that, with whether they were you know cracking down on some of the large technology companies there, or you know rethinking their foreign relationships with U.S. governments. What really, you know, broke the camel's back for us was when the U.S. started expanding its blacklist of companies that they said U.S. investors are no longer allowed to invest in these companies in China. And one of those companies was DGI, the, the drone company that was primarily funded by a bunch of Silicon Valley investors. And so you had a company with a primarily Western cap table that the U.S. came in and said, nope, not allowed to anymore. And clearly, those investors had to had to sell out of that uh, business um, on on no particularly great terms, and that really got to a point where we were no longer just being contrarian in the prices, but we were really being forced to to pick a side. And as a U.S. based fund with U.S. based investors, uh, with a with a country that has really taken the stance of uh, you know our, our relationship with them is is growing apart, you know, no longer closer together. It became a business decision for us, and you know, having to research two markets, you know, one of which that's that's open overnight, uh, and the other one which is open daytime here, was simply stretching you know our team too thinly. And you know, we concluded that there were enough other securities and great companies in the world for us to you know deliver the type of returns that we're seeking for our investors without having to do all the effort of continuing to sustain our investment presence there. So that's a lot on, on just, uh, on just Baba, but there there was, there was a lot of work that, uh, that went into that process. You know, one of the fascinating things about meta, the, the, the the multiple on the business has just continued to, to contract. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, with management's, you know, stubbornness about investing in the metaverse and the amount they're willing to put into that. Uh, The company couldn't be, or it certainly could (laughs) never say never is trading at, as attractive of a valuation as it ever has in its history as a public or a private company. And Meta, you could even contrast it to say an Amazon right now. Amazon has is, is negative free cash flow. Meta, for all of its issues, is still printing more than $30 billion of free cash flow. But investors today have decided to say, well, you know, we're going to punish Meta for that and put this sub $500 billion market cap on it. Amazon, we believe your margins are going to come back. We believe that free cash flow is going to show up again in the future. And we're going to put, we're going to kind of bake that into your, into your market cap today. So we actually don't think the competitive environment for Meta has changed. We don't think the regulatory environment has gotten so bad that it's, it's unfit for investment. And you have a management team that has managed transitions into video, transitions into stories uh, multiple times in their past. 
as a long-term investor, it's one of the few opportunities out there where, you know, we, we certainly think that there's the potential for generational wealth expansion. So I'd say that in spite of the, you know, price and, and market volatility that you've seen there, there's nothing that has sort of changed in the underlying fundamentals or competitive position about that, that company that scare us. And then uh, lastly, Berkshire. I, gosh, it's just a reminder that there's just always some amount of Berkshire that you have to have in your portfolio. Every investment decision I've ever made at any point in my life, I always benchmarked against what if I had just bought Berkshire Hathaway instead on that date. And that has been one of the, the greatest learning tools for me because it's really you know sharpened my lens on understanding you know when is Berkshire really attractively valued, when is it you know sort of fairly valued, and it's just such a, a, a lower volatile stock. To again give a quick example. You could have owned the S and P 500, or you could have owned Berkshire Hathaway. You know, for the same, let's say over the last ten years, you know, same period, same returns, but half the volatility. That's just an incredible investment product. You know, the number of investors that would try, you know, so hard to to manufacture something like that. So it's still incredible what they've built, and, and the fact they have a management team that is built around capital reallocation. There's just uh, th- there's just no other company like it in the world. So it's a it's a smaller percent of our portfolio today, uh, but it's a company we will never stop tracking. I like it. I mean, it's an extremely unique company, as you you know alluded to there. I also love the quote. I'm probably going to borrow it that there's always some percentage of Berkshire that you should have in your portfolio because it's true. I mean, it's true. I feel like anyone yeah. I know who uh, you know invests uh, thinks a lot about that and and similarly kind of benchmarks their decisions. I'd love to turn to biggest learnings over the last couple of years. And, you know, kind of preparing for this interview, you and I went back and forth talking about kind of three of these. And, you know, I'm going to do something to kind of, I guess, read at, read aloud the three that we came up with, and then just have you expand and share your perspective on each. And the first one, you know, is around growth and just this idea that you always have to be learning new industries. Talk a little bit about that and expand on that idea. We've covered a bit. Most of my background is in consumer internet. I helped build a direct consumer brand at, at Elevation. We were, we were big investors in, in Facebook and Yelp and all these media and e-commerce assets. And what's one of the things that's misleading about trying to become the best analyst that you can in the markets or companies that you're exposed to is as you get to know these companies so well, you become very confident in your ability to select amongst them. However, you lose the ability to see whether or not that category as a whole is still as attractive as it once was for investment when you might have been thrown on it as an analyst however many years ago. And so one of the, you know, one of the, you know, obviously the the learnings and transitions is, is, is going from analyst into portfolio manager where your role really does change because you have to consider you know how is the quality of the industry still there like it like it once was um, so that was on the consumer internet side and it, I mean to, to give an example of this yeah, Netflix and Spotify are, are two examples of businesses that were able to generate a, a pretty incredible amount of growth on reasonable investment levels they, they were sort of medium in capital intensity but one of the things that has been masked in uh, or hasn't gotten talked about as much. Sure, their subscribers are slowing down. Sure, their addressable markets maybe aren't as big as they were attempting to advertise to their investors. But what's worse is that their marketing costs are exploding. So what it costs them to sustain viewership and listenership across their platforms, as well as acquire you know, the, the smaller remaining number of subscribers that they have you know, pursuing their product, that is a structural issue that exists at the at the industry level. And you know, this is this falls into that bucket now of you can love the management team and you can love the product, but if it is not in a particularly great industry with little competition, they're going to have a really tough sledding, you know, generating the type of free cash flow that uh, that investors envision uh, even at even at the prices that uh, that we see today. So, one of the get, getting back to your your original question here on on one of the learnings and and at the industry level it's a very intimidating thing to know how much you can learn about a single category, realize that there are limitations to the you know, potential future of that category, and then realize, uh-oh, uh, it took me 12 years to become this good at that category 
but cloud computing is now arguably where digital advertising was five years ago. How do I become 12 years good at cloud computing in six months? <laughs> which is, which you can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult. I mean, I love, I love that perspective. I, I love that perspective. I, it also, you know, is just a reminder, one of many, I'm sure we'll cover in this, in this episode about just why investing is so difficult because there are so many pieces of the puzzle that you need to consider, that you need to keep tabs on, that you need to square up, I think, in order to, um, you know, always be making the right decision, uh, which obviously no one can ever do. Moving on to number two, uh, quants. You know, you talked about this at the beginning um, of adding uh, a quantitative person to your team. That's something I want to return to a couple more times in this interview because I think it's really interesting. But, you know, the kind of takeaway there was that it's a great muscle to add to the investment team for better risk management. I think it'd be interesting if you could talk one about just maybe expand a little bit more on what adding a quant added. And, you know, I would be curious too, was hiring a quant difficult for you? Was that an easy decision? Was it something you grappled with? And then to talk a little bit about how it has helped the risk management side. So Lars, uh, he joined us uh, last summer. Uh, sometimes, in, you know, when you're building a startup, some things, sometimes you get lucky. Some things come to you, you know, more quickly than it takes you to find them. And uh, Lars reached out to us, uh, you know, much like you, you first did a long time ago and said, what you're doing sounds different. I think I might be able to help. And, you know, we weren't, we weren't explicitly looking for someone in his role at the time, but we said, well, here are some things we're thinking through right now. How would you approach these? And he came back with very elaborate analyses uh, and gave, came back with ways of thinking about things that we were not looking at them. And it sort of forced us to rethink, you know, some of our approaches to the problem. And it was an incredibly natural process. And we thought, well, gosh, we should probably really have him you know, inside the uh, inside the doors here, uh, working through these problems with us, and yeah, I shared some of the things earlier. So, so Joe, uh, who's who's worked with me, you know, nearly since the beginning, really, you know, l- like me, his the background is in sort of fundamental, you know, individual stock selection. You know, I want the I want the best product in the best market with the best management team, hopefully at a somewhat uh, a decent price, and you know, goes really deep into competitor transcripts and customer calls and. Uh, you know, how management's tone is changing, you know, here or there from, um, you know, anytime they're kind of speaking to the public. And so what we've learned along the way of, of bolting on to this individual stock selection process, I mentioned the transition from being a research analyst into being a portfolio manager. And the addition of the quantitative analytics has accelerated our portfolio management decisions, which is different than uh, stock selection. Because it has to do with what's your exposure like to end markets, whether at an industry level or a customer size. SMBs are different than enterprise or different than consumers. It helps you understand uh, the relative valuation multiples of, you know, for example, one of the things we track is Amazon always trades at some premium, but the premium that it trades at relative to all these other smaller players in the e-commerce industry, Chewy and Etsy and, and, and whoever else, that gap changes over time. So there are moments in time in which it's more attractive to own the leader in the industry. There are moments in time where it's more attractive to own. And those are very difficult things to follow as, a, as an individual stock selector. Uh, but when you have someone that's able to you know, boil the ocean on data, it gives you a much cleaner perspective on where things might be overheated from a valuation standpoint, as well as where you know, there might be opportunities to, good to go start fishing for that, uh, that next security. So I would say that the number one benefit has been on the risk management side and to point out, I mean, we haven't been inside the doors at Tiger Global or at KOTU for the last you know handful of years here, but based off of what's been reported in the press, and if you were to go on LinkedIn and see the people that they've hired onto their teams, KOTU has made an explicit effort over the past five years to bring quantitative analysts onto their team. Tiger didn't. And if you look at what their year-to-date returns are, KOTU is taking victory laps for having taken a lot of risk off the table at the end of 2021, whereas Tiger has held firm as a long-term investor in their companies. And I, without knowing for sure, but my experience you know, leads me to believe that it is the quants at KOTU that helped drove many of those risk management decisions that uh, protected the returns this year. 
Yeah. It's a fascinating takeaway, you know, because I think one, it makes the point in a wonderful way that yes, you can be great at selecting the right securities, but ultimately it's a portfolio that has to work together. And so being able to analyze, as you pointed out, exposure to end markets, you know, kind of weightings, multiples, relative attractiveness is really interesting. Um, and I do love that point. You know, I, like many investors, I think, um, respect a lot of what KOTU does. Last point is operator advantage. And this one I really like, and I'm excited to hear your take on. And, you know, the kind of learning there was just, uh, and it's very simple, but I'm sure there's a lot to it. You know, knowing the people behind public companies matters. Clearly that would intuitively make sense. Talk about why that's been so important in the role that's played. One of the challenges as a public investor is that you are an extremely minority investor in the companies that you're participating in. As Joe likes to say, that means you are getting the company as it is. And if you think that, you know, you need to sit around for a new CEO or for a change in board, you know, buckle up. I hope you've got a lot of patience because that investment is likely to underperform your benchmark or underperform, you know, other securities that you're, that, that you're looking at. And so I, what we found is that the, so you have to, you, you want ideally there to already be the people at the company that would be either you know running the company as if you owned it you know in in full in its entirety or if you were running it yourself and you know this is some of the advantage of you know having a career spending some time in new york and spending some time out out in the bay area a great example is bill reddy he was someone that uh i hadn't known about hadn't asked about but multiple people that i'd worked with in my career some that had worked at venmo with him some that had worked at, at paypal with him brought him up to me and and talked about their experiences working with him as being so outstanding and so transformational in their own careers and i wasn't even fishing for the information and you just you don't forget those things and, and when you see someone like that get promoted into a position like that there's a lot of reasons to believe that that's likely a, a potential <laughs> good step for the company to be so well regarded and to have worked with companies in their early stage, their growth stage, and even their maturity stage, and, and, and be such a valuable player. Also, it even helps a little bit to know that you know when someone like that leaves a company, it's because he's leaving it, not because he's getting kicked out. We can contrast this uh, with, to be frank, someone like Evan Spiegel. And Evan has had really high turnover in his uh, executive ranks in the years that he has been running the company. And that turnover in executives' ranks, those executives haven't, you know, all of a sudden been gotten, you know, incredible jobs at Amazon or, you know, some other great large franchise. And that's an issue. And that, that's one of the things that you, even, you know, Meta scores really well on is, you know, their, their management team has been there a really long time. There's lots of internal promotion. That means there's a lot of great worker development that happens within the organization itself. And when there's a lot more churning, you know, going on internally or folks on the outside, that's expensive. And, you know, that works against this sort of compounder philosophy on, you know, building, you know, learnings on top of learnings, you know, and growing with the people as much as you can with the people that you have, as opposed to thinking that all of a sudden new people can sort of change the, the shape or the outcome of your business. And so I do think, you know, this is where it's sort of the people component, whether it's from specific individuals and the way that they manage or, you know, the way that a company, you know, operates uh, within itself. Uh, is in fact uh, an important determinant of um, of success with an investment. Yeah, I love the you know comparing and contrasting Bill Reddy with Evan Spiegel, uh, and you kind of beat me to the punch because I was going to bring up Snap as we were talking about Meta in a second. But you know, I think I kind of know your thoughts generally now. One of the questions I want to ask with someone like Bill Reddy is. You know, anytime you have a company that, you know, you don't need to, doesn't, let's, we don't need to say that it needs to be turned around, but you're looking for, you know, you, you know that it needs to start a new chapter and they're bringing in someone like Bill Reddy. In your mind, obviously a lot of that you're waiting the person and, and what you've heard about them and how you think they can perform in the role. What percentage, if you were to try to guess, you know, do they factor into the success of the turnaround or the success of the new chapter? And what I mean by that is that, you know, as you're thinking around these things, just from my experience, people matter a lot, but ultimately people that are coming in can also be faced with structural challenges or big challenges. How do you try to sort that out? Or just do you have any thoughts there on the ability for one person to make a difference? <laughs> it's a great follow-up because Pinterest is a great specific example because Pinterest actually built a lot of great things. They've, they already have a self-serve ad platform. One of the 
you know, slowest of like, I think Twitter today, I mean, I'm sure they say they do, but for all intents and purposes, they don't. Uh, and they're still selling media, you know, through salespeople in a very traditional way, like they're a television station on cable. Uh, and uh, Pinterest was actually ahead of the game in a, in a handful of their product features. And where Pinterest was, was really lacking is that they uh, was really international was this piece where they're a much bigger asset outside the U.S. than they are inside the U.S. But the way that they'd organized a team and the way they'd built their company, uh, it was so U.S. focused that their monetization in the U.S. was so far in excess of what they were able to do anywhere else around the world. And the U.S., of course, is a higher ARPU market than elsewhere, but uh, Pinterest was disproportionately uh, monetized in the U.S. relative to the amount of uh, business they were generating elsewhere. And that is an example to me of an organization with strong product leadership, with a great fundamental business, but a lack of operational discipline in expanding its tentacles as a global organization. And for someone like Bill that is such an exceptional operator, it's pretty good fit from my vantage point as an investor to say, great, let's get the business that's structured, that has struggled a little bit on the operational chops. They got into a, a lawsuit fight with their former COO. They you know, promoted their you know, CFO into a different you know, temporary position. And to now say, we have enough of the core building blocks in place. We don't need a product visionary. We need an operator to, to, to really help run what we're already doing uh, better and more efficiently. And I, I, th I think the style and experience of the person matches the challenge of the company. And that may change as the, as the competitive set changes for, for Pinterest in the future. Uh, but for what their, what their core issues are right now, I actually think it's a really, really good match. Yeah, it's very well said. I mean, I love, I just love hearing you talk and expand on these things because it's very clear how thoughtful and how deep of a thinker you are. So I love kind of walking through that. Thanks for, thanks for that. I want to take a little bit of time now to talk about, you know, kind of the top three positions or three of the larger positions in Compound Kings. And two of them we'll cover are very different from obviously what we talked about last year. One of them is the same, and that's Meta. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask, you kind of alluded to it a little bit more from the human angle of comparing and contrasting Meta to Snap. But I guess I'd be curious, you know, to get your take on one do you think they're making the right decision in investing the metaverse? I know that that's a hot topic at the moment, and there's a very wide range of opinions on, is this going to work out? They're investing an enormous amount. But, you know, one, why is that still a position? And then how do you think, how do you think of Meta's business for looking forward from here and kind of the metaverse element of it? Sure. I'm going to explain for a second why I'm so excited about the business, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into some of the thoughts on the metaverse side of it. We talked a little bit about source documents earlier, and uh, in 2018, during one of the congressional uh, testimonies on Meta, uh, there was this great exhibit that was included, and it, it forced Meta to show the relative size of each of their four platforms, uh, WhatsApp and Instagram and Messenger and Facebook, um, in the top 30 developed countries or something like that. And what was, what was fascinating is that in, in any given country, a different one of the four products might have been, you know, the number one leader. And there were a lot of really cool insights in the, in the, in the report that you got to see about how Instagram was just growing so fast everywhere. It wasn't necessarily cannibalizing Facebook's lead. In some markets, WhatsApp was the dominant leader. Uh, it had to do with if, they, if it was a market where the iPhone wasn't the de facto leader, that meant WhatsApp is the de facto messaging product. And, you know, when you, when you see a business laid out on a piece of paper like that, you realize, um, how much more complex it is than any you know individual to attempt to you know understand all by themselves, and that likely speaks to the the scale of of Meta being larger than I believe a lot of investors give it credit for. And to be blunt, I, you know, or, or to make a, a blunt comparison, AT and T. Uh, was a, a very big piece of the S and P 500 for for very many years, and they ran into regulation. They got broken up, and they got put back together. And you know, they've they've actually been a decent investment throughout throughout a lot of that. And you could almost think through um, Meta as a as the modern communications platform, um, but it's it's global, it's uh, less regulated, but that's growing over time, and it's got an incredibly uh, stronger business model because they're not charging fixed 
price subscriptions, they're able to price discriminate because they sell advertising to all these small business advertisers. Now, that business model runs into more problems because it can be politically influenced or you can have bad actors that imagine if imagine back in the day at AT AT&T and someone could call you and, you know, drop a bunch of misinformation in your ear, you know, through your phone. That's a that's a. You understand why that communications company got regulated so quickly. So there's there's trade offs to that structure, um, but I, I think you know, Meta is a, a much more complex business than than any than any investor that says, "Gosh, they're growing slower." And in fact, you know, for all the fears about TikTok, one of the things that we really closely track is we look at the top hundred accounts on Instagram. We look at their followers and their engagement, and the um, the the follower growth on Instagram is continuing to exceed the follower growth on TikTok if you were to look at the same 100 accounts over on TikTok. So for all of TikTok's successes, which have, have absolutely been um, um, uh, worthy of kind of notice and study, Meta is still, in fact, growing from uh, from the position that they're in as big as they are. Now, to address this metaverse issue, which is an issue, <laughs> the Part of the history of it has been that Facebook has was worked through so many transitions, desktop to mobile, photos to video, and they're trying to get ahead of whatever the next transition is. And this is where I think a lot of healthy debate deserves to be had around the company because Mark has made the decision that it's worth allocating at least 12 or $13 billion of capital into annually to get ahead of because you know they view themselves as competing against Apple you know, long-term on this or Microsoft long-term on this. And they think that's the volume of capital required to be competitive. Now, the challenge is you look at, say, a Roblox, which is the most realized version of a metaverse company today, and it's a $30 billion market cap company. So uh, what's Meta going to do? You know, spend the entire market cap of the metaverse in the next four years chasing the metaverse. So I I do think there's a lot of reasonable debate that can be made about um, whether or not the company is investing in a high return on capital way with it. It's something we're staying really close to. You're looking at less than, say, 5% of their market cap over the next you know, few years. They are diligent enough in the remainder of their capital allocation as it comes to their uh, share count, as it comes to their you know, hiring growth. Their core business is still driving great engagement in ARPUs. So taking the whole picture together, we're excited about the long-term opportunity without having to be excited about the metaverse turning into anything. Yeah, I love that analysis. And I, and I love the comparison um, of you know Facebook building a modern communications platform. I feel like I've heard takes on that, but I think that's the most compelling way I've heard it framed. Um, I, I really like that. The second one you kind of alluded to a little bit earlier when you were talking about where public cloud is now, and that company is ServiceNow. And then, you know, I would want to hear a little bit of maybe your thesis on public cloud, what you like in particular about ServiceNow. But one of the questions I also want to ask is ServiceNow is a really interesting example of a company that has been compounding for a very long time already. And so people could maybe look at it cynically and just say, well, is the compounding already behind us? How much compounding is left in the future. Maybe if you could start there and then kind of work into more about ServiceNow and why it's interesting. So ServiceNow, they are not the cutting edge cloud computing company. Clearly that's, you know, AWS plus Datadog plus Snowflake plus, you know, you've got your data, you know, warehouse plus your analytics uh, platform plus your storage and um, web. ServiceNow is different because they were the call it the the first truly cloud-based ERP. And if you went back into the um, history of enterprise resource planning, most of the companies got built around which executive uh, they were serving. So Workday was serving your your CHRO. Um, Salesforce was serving your chief revenue officer, your head of sales. And uh, ServiceNow, uh, because they they didn't grow up in the in the, in the legacy, they kind of got to, to start in the cloud ERP world. Uh, served the CIO, and the the, the rise of the the chief information officer uh, or information systems, however however you like to think about it, is potentially the most impactful position to serve because they are the biggest budget spender on uh, software infrastructure decisions for the company. So. You know, the CFO was always a tricky one because, you know, there were plenty of the CFO always needed, you know, all the, all the you know, financial uh, ERP software 
in order to get their monthly financial support of financials done on time. But that was actually a little bit more of a competitive market than what ServiceNow has been able to carve out with the CIOs. So one of the things that we really like about ServiceNow is that it has owned this, call it pivotal executive position um, uh, within so many different types of companies. And what they build is actually pretty customized into any given company that they're working for. And because you get that added layer of customization, it's a little bit more expensive up front, but it usually turns into a longer customer lifecycle time. And so we view ServiceNow, I mean, the U.S. government happens to be one of their very large customers, but they have nearly government-like contracts with the biggest companies in the world. And when you ask the question about, well, how can you be excited about the future compounding of this business given the amount of growth they've had so far? Growth from existing customers. That is when, when, a, when a business that size is, generates so much growth from its existing customers, like it has done for so long, that is typically an indicator that that, co- that company will continue to surprise investors on the amount of incremental business that is going to do going forward because they aren't having to find new customers to do it. They're simply having to penetrate their existing customers more deeply with more product and services. And they haven't even done much M&A to chase that. And that that's what investors give them a hard time for. They say, you're not going to get the sales force because you haven't done the acquisitions. And you know, management team keeps pushing back and saying, well, let's see how far we can take this because we have so far defied all of your expectations without having to do all of this bolt-on M&A. So bolt-on M&A is, as we see it, is simply an opportunity for a company like that, um, you know, should they see the need for it uh, in, in the future. Um, but you've, you've got to be impressed with the amount of organic growth that, um, that a company like that has done. Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I love that answer. I love that framing. It makes a lot of sense. I'm going to ask a question and you can totally, this is a free pass to say, you know, not interested in talking about it. Haven't, haven't done enough homework, but, um, you know, obviously ServiceNow and Snowflake both have Frank Slootman, um, you know, to thank for at least part of their trajectory, part of the history of being the CEO of the business. Any thoughts on Frank Slootman as an operator or Snowflake as obviously a very different bet in the space, but any thoughts there? I don't have, and we talked about the operator, the people side of things before. I do not have any uh, unique insights on Frank Slootman that the market doesn't already have or know about him. What I'll share is that there's a, uh, there was a great uh, employee interview from someone that I believe had worked with him at both ServiceNow and Snowflake and sort of had some intelligent observations about the evolution of leadership at, at ServiceNow because uh, they, had, they had John Donahoe, they had Frank Slootman, and, and now they've got Bill McDermott and Frank Slootman now obviously at, at Snowflake. And they had a, uh, gosh, I want to remember the way they articulated this right which was you know the early years of service now uh, when it was in you know startup mode and you know figuring out its core products and kicking down its first big doors with customers frank was just such an outstanding leader for that and then once they got all those doors open but you potentially don't necessarily have the best internal culture cuz frank doesn't care about anybody's feelings you had you know John Donahoe come in and uh, help get the existing company playing uh, more nicely within itself, um, and you know you you want that culturally long term. Obviously, what Tim Cook has done with Apple has been quite commendable in that regard. And after you know John Donahoe continued to sort of entrench further with with existing customers, then you get Bill McDermott coming in, and Bill McDermott, you know, really big company uh, CEO from SAP. And what's interesting about Bill McDermott coming in, we talk about what are the problems with the company and what are, or what are the key things they have to work on. Channel partners have become one of the biggest growth engines for ServiceNow. So many, many Microsoft enterprise uh, products are not sold by anybody on Microsoft's payroll. They're sold by this long list of reseller businesses that you know, are either call themselves consultants or sometimes accounting firms or something else. But really, they're actually just selling Microsoft products. And that has been one of the biggest engines of ServiceNow's growth over the last handful of years. And that is an area where Bill is uniquely able to help grow that business better because he is there to help foster that reseller ecosystem for ServiceNow. And if you, if you pull up a handful of calls on some of these resellers, a handful of them are public companies, they are citing ServiceNow as their primary growth driver amongst 
all of the other you know software platforms that are out there. And as investors on the outside, these are the little hints you know that that we look for, and it's the best we get in some cases um, as to you know which companies are um, sort of chasing the biggest opportunities. So a little bit of a different answer to you know who is Frank Sutman, and a little bit more of an answer of you can have different people you know over the life cycle of companies uh, and still see a really successful business you know form. And you know, how far Frank you know will take a snowflake has so much more to do with you know his own personal life and decisions that I could never you know forecast as an analyst. And lastly, Robert, I would love to have you just talk a little bit about Adyen. Um, and I think what I'm curious about there is just general thesis and thoughts on Adyen, thoughts on some of the competitors, because it happens to at least look like, feel like a very competitive space. And then just thoughts on, you know, picking Adyen and what you particularly like about that business or business model. So the evolution of payments technology, I, I, I think, is one of the more exciting areas right now, because the gap between the legacy infrastructure, whether it's from First Data or Fiserv, versus what is newly available to merchants through these API-based payments acceptance platforms, that gap is really wide. We were previously talking about ServiceNow. The difference between ServiceNow and some of its competitors at Microsoft or, or some of the independents is, is narrower than the gap between Adyen and the, the legacy businesses that they're competing against. And you hear this time and again from, from the customers that, that make the switch from, a, from an ATOS to an Adyen. Now, there is a lot of curiosity about the competitive dynamics between Stripe and Adyen and DLocal, who are arguably the, the three you know, global leaders in this space. And Stripe made the decision early on to sort of start with smaller businesses. They were in the Bay Area. They, they got installed very early with, with Lyft and all of the delivery companies and all the vacation platforms, you name it, uh, and got to grow you know, with those companies and increase the complexity of the product over time. Adyen, because of the, the, the history of some of the founders, they started at the other end of the market. They said, we're going to start at the top. You know, we want to build a, a Fortune 500 um, quality product out of the gates. And that's something that takes longer to build at the front but then get you particularly valuable customers. And clearly, you know, Stripe's dream is to penetrate that, that same tier customer set and they've already, you know, are, are well along in that journey. But as, you know, fingers crossed, we'll see Stripe as a public company in the next couple of years. Adyen's capital efficiency and free cash flow generation. I don't have to see Stripe's numbers to know that Adyen is a higher margin, bigger cash generating business than, than what Stripe is because Stripe has spread itself so much more thinly across so many, so many more, so many more projects. Um, now that said, you're starting with a great industry, so there's it, the the threshold of selection across the businesses is less challenging because the future is likely bright for all three of them. Because you've got those three, and then it's you got to go pretty far down the list to find you know close uh, close competitors. And there's trillions of dollars that they're all going to be processing uh, in the years to come, which which is what makes it. Um, uh, a pretty interesting place to invest. Is there anything about Adyen's culture that, you know, I think a theme that I've really enjoyed in this interview is talking about the human element and how that maybe shows up in building a, a business. And, you know, even just in the answer that you shared there of obviously by, you know, because of their background, they're choosing to honestly take on the more difficult challenge by building for the top of the market first and then slowly kind of moving down market. And so I'm curious, you know, you obviously alluded to there, I think Stripe has an interesting culture. They've made some interesting decisions around spreading them, you know, basically having a proliferation of products and serve like an expl a Cambrian explosion is probably the right word. I mean, you go to their website, you look at the products and it's like, there's like 60 different things to choose from now. And it's hard to see that growing. Anyways, I guess the question I would ask is, is there anything that similarly stands out cultural in the way they make decisions in, in the way they approach building the business about Adyen? What's cool about the couple things that I'll, I'll point out that are different about both the management and the board structure one is the management team is like all in that sweet spot where like these guys are not in their 50s and 60s. They're on their second or third startup. They've already been successful in their careers, success, but not, not so successful as to, to give up yet. And most of the team has been internally promoted, which is great. They have not had to rely a ton on external hires. They've got to where they are you know, with a lot of their core team in place. One of the other things that stands out is their team is so focused on what they're doing at Adyen. Now you could say this has this is potentially because Europe does not have as many 
unicorn distractions for their management teams to go join five other boards. But that's one of the issues with you know, some of the US-based companies. There's so many grabs for attention on the executives that they get pulled into a few more places than just the company that they're working on. So combining the elements of having a strong core team that has mostly been internally developed, that is still there today, and does not have a lot of outside uh, separate interests going on, that's pretty rare to find at a company of their size and evolution. And then you know, going a step further, and if you were to look at their board, what I really like about how they've architected it is it's really a board of advisors. And those advisors have key competencies in the areas that are uniquely important to a payments business. So regulatory compliance, infrastructure, technology, big enterprise customer sales. You know, you you really want, I I do think Meta has done a good job about architecting their board similarly around the things that matter most to, to Meta. But that's actually quite rare to find in U.S. companies. Our U.S. boards, they're so political. You know, they focus around, you know, the head of the comp committee has to sit on seven other comp committees of other boards. And how much independent thought are you really getting when you're just having this person that is just averaging together what they're seeing across all these comp committees? They're not doing something that is uniquely an issue for that particular company. So I, I, I respect the way that they've organized that board around advisorship as opposed to governorship. Now, that could be a risk longer term of the investment if, if there are you know, governance issues that, that you know, we end up bumping into. But certainly from a, from a growth company, from a growth mindset, it's a, uh, it's a uniquely architected team. Yeah, that's a fascinating answer. I'd love to close out with, and we can make this a speed, you know, somewhat of a speed round of just talking a little bit about the business of running an ETF, growing an ETF, because there's a, you know, this is obviously, it feels to me like, yes, you're, you know, as an investor, you're always iterating, refining your investment philosophy. It seems like you guys have found a groove there. The business of building an ETF F business is a little bit different. And, you know, as you and I were catching up, talking about what we might cover here, I think some of the most interesting topics are in what it actually takes to build an ETF business. And so I'm going to ask in a second, you know, we'll talk about wholesalers. Um, we'll talk about, um, you know, financial advisors. But what I wanted to start with is just super broad. What does it look like to build an ETF business? And what if you learned about that over the last 18 to 24 months? No small questions here. Low barriers to entry of launching the product. High barriers to entry of mattering to investors. I start by summing it up that way. And our own experience so far is that we've attracted um, a a healthy amount of attention from self-directed investors like yourself that know the rigor that they would put any company through in you know deciding to make an investment into it and appreciate call it the the luxury of getting to ride along with an investment team that is doing you know the work on a few more companies that they would like to do if they had the time to do it so that's been a cool little uh, you know corner of the universe that that um, that we've resonated with and that's certainly you know a lot of the community that um, uh, we've been able to um, grow with on on Twitter uh, now the Reverse side of this is uh, in chasing the aspiration of, of managing a fund that any investor can access, the majority, the vast majority of Americans uh, still rely on their financial advisors for investment placement. So if you want to grow a retail investment management company, you have to figure out how to make your fund useful to financial advisors. And uh, their approach is actually often to be skeptical of funds that have performed because they may be fearful of reversion of mean or fearful of luck. And clearly today we, we speak about our strategy differently than we did you know, a year ago. And some of that has come through the laborious process of meeting with hundreds of financial advisors and hearing about the things that they care about what we're doing, the things that they don't care about what we're doing. Something I'll share as an example is this, this phrase, active share. Active share is increasingly becoming one of the most important differentiating elements of an actively managed ETF, which is what percent of the stocks that you own differ from some you know, broad market index. So in the S&P 500 case, we're at about 86% and rising. And that means that relative to the companies that we own, even though you may see some of the same companies in the S&P in our portfolio, 
it usually means that we are holding them in an overweight position relative to how the S&P might be holding it. And that means that we are giving those investors access to either companies that are outside of many of the indices that they already own, or we are overweighting specific positions where we see you know, potential for, for higher compounding to happen for them. So there's been changes in some of the go-to-market approach of the reasons to uh, participate in a, in a fund like this that matters. And as we get further down the chain, you know, as you continue to build for the financial advisory community, I mean, there are tens of thousands of, of advisors, all of the, call it more than 100,000 financial advisors that are there to potentially connect with in the US, but many of them are on different platforms. And there's really sort of a, a graduation of stages. And you know, we're small. So as a, as a $10 million fund, there's a specific set of 20,000 advisors. You know, and you know, when we're a $50 million fund, there's another twenty or 30,000 advisors that we can talk to. And as you, as you climb the AUM ranks, you sort of open up these tiers of, um, of groups to speak with. But ultimately, you're doing all of this work because this is the way to get those end real-life investors to participate in, in what you're doing. I've enjoyed the challenge, but it is, you, can't, you, you can't have a short uh, time horizon in doing it. No, no. And it goes back to your point of, you know, if if your end goal is to have a large, durable, enduring, you know, very successful fund, and this is just one of those things you have to figure out. You have to brute force it. You have to figure it out your way. You have to figure out how to make it work. Um, I'd love to kind of go in two different directions next. I, I'm going to come back to in a second and talk a little bit about, you know, communicating with your investors, mostly through Twitter or public.com. You've done a bunch of interesting stuff there, but I want to start uh, kind of expanding on what you've just been saying about reaching these end, uh, you know, investors by talking about wholesaling. Because honestly, when you and I were talking about um, you know, what it's taken to kind of uh, grow Compound Kings, wholesaling was something that I didn't even really know much about. And so I think it'd be interesting if, you know, I think people listening would find it very interesting to one, just if you could give a quick brief overview of what wholesaling is, talk a little bit about what gro- great wholesaling looks like and in, in what you guys have been pursuing and, and doing there. Mostly for good. I've been very surprised to learn how much the retail investment management business looks like the enterprise software business. And what's unique about the enterprise software business, again, pull any enterprise software business up on LinkedIn, and they have two types of employees. They have engineers and they have salespeople. And if you were to look at, again, very large retail investment management companies, there's two types of people. There's the investment analysts, and then there's the sales team. And what's fascinating about that is that the, the businesses long term also demonstrate similar durability and similar margins. So really, the role of wholesalers in the investment business is no different than the enterprise software sales team, which is they have to hunt for, I've got this product, or I've got this, this piece of software, it's this tool, it does these things. And so in our case, you know, we're not paying dividends, so we're not giving you any cash but they compound. And so these guys are going after the businesses at the highest internal rate of return to give uh, or at least help diversify the ways that you can grow client assets over time relative to just owning the S&P 500. Uh, Now, but the way that you do that is through a pretty long lead time. And in the same way as enterprise software sales, it starts with the the cold hunting. First, you have to figure out the types of firms that are even have the potential to be interested in this product. And then there's the relationship development that happens. And many of the best... Uh, wholesalers out there are incredible people connectors that are that are able to connect with people on a very one to one level and are not shy about uh, having long conversations about the things that is bugging you know the advisor you know at that moment in time and hopefully they'll have a you know some some like to call it you know being a doctor and you know, having ten different prescriptions and we only have one prescription today which is you know our compounder vehicle. But as you can imagine, you know, expanding, you know, that that assortment for, you know, those sales folks over time so that they can alleviate whatever the issue is that that advisor may be, you know, feeling or going through at that moment in time. And then over time, again, these those those individual relationships that they build compound because it's not a one time sale. It's a recurring relationship through which more and more business is done in the future. And we have uh, it's certainly something that we, we knew we'd have to build at some point. Uh, but it's something that we're we're starting to crack ground on a little earlier. 
I love that comparison and analogy as well as, uh, you know, the investment business being actually very similar to the enterprise sales business, because it does make a lot of sense. It, it also is, you know, I think a, an observation I haven't heard made before. Um, maybe the last thing I'd love to talk about is how you communicate with investors. You know, we've talked before about open sourcing and sharing your investment ideas on Twitter and the types of feedback and, you know, unique perspectives and takes that you get from that. You guys also use Twitter. I, I think amazingly, like I've really enjoyed following you and seeing the different iterations of how do you, you've shared updates on Twitter, real-time thoughts around uh, you know some of the stocks that you own um, and, and what's happening with them. And I think it's very modern. I haven't seen any other you know fund managers, I think, taking the approach that you have. So I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about just how you think about communicating with investors. And you know I know Twitter's uh, one element of that. I know public.com is another element of that. I think it'd be interesting if you could just kind of touch on all those and how you think about that. Yeah, we've learned a lot growing within the uh, the Fintuit community. Um, and a lot of it has been, you know, observing how, you know, other, you know, folks that are successful in their investment careers use it. And one of the, one of the phrases that a lot of people will mention is that this is a, this is an open workbook where, you know, we are actively sharing, you know, recent thoughts or conclusions, and it's as much for ourselves as it is for, you know, anyone else that, you know, elects to engage with it. I think that's a great starting point. Because from there, at a minimum, it is providing a utility to you, whether or not people happen to be engaging back. And you definitely find over time that uh, people will in- engage with things or sort of surprise you with things where you didn't necessarily expect them to. So the, the, what I'll say is the, the core parts of the routine is, you know, during earnings season, we are on top of uh, our, our holdings. And, you know, we are sharing not, as quickly as, as anybody you know, the, the biggest takeaways from, you know, what's happening during earnings calls or, or from earnings releases. We're on a monthly basis, you know, posting, here's the latest on our portfolio. And sometimes if, if a security has kind of fallen up or down the ranks, that's an opportunity for, for folks to engage and say, well, why is this no longer a priority? Or why did this, you know, this one come up the list or whatever the case is. And then the, uh, the third thing is what I would describe as, as much more, you know, moments of inspiration or, Moments in time where we feel like our research on a particular matter has come to a conclusion and we would like to stamp it and, you know, put it in the files. And that's really when the the threads come together. So we have absolutely no kind of, you know, set time of we're going to do this thread about this thing on this date. The inspiration has to hit that the research is good enough or differentiated enough to justify, you know, putting a thread together. And it's, it's pretty fascinating to see how much engagement threads really uh, do. It's arguably the, the highest value thing from what we've seen from what the, com- from the community asks for, but it's not something that can be really manufactured um, on an incredibly frequent basis. Yeah, not at all. I think, I think the last question I would ask there is just, you know, hearing you say that, it, it, if, as an investor, especially someone who loves Twitter, I'm always on Twitter. I think it's an amazing platform. Um, you know, I I love following you and getting those updates there. I think a question I'd ask is, you know, did you have to convince your team at all, or convince yourself that it was worth the effort of putting these threads together and doing this? And what have you learned, or what would you share with other emerging managers about the value of doing that? Well, I'd say the team convinced me. Yeah, Joe. <laughs> Joe gets a lot of credit for, for helping educate me on, uh, on, on the value of that outlet. Now, I'm, I'm going to give Kathy credit on this. She, she says something similar, which is uh, being so open with uh, the decisions that we make and the research that we do uh, forces a level of refinement around our work that doesn't exist if we weren't publishing it so widely. And... I believe that a lot of investment managers that you know are are pursuing the pure independent thought path might actually find that their uh, learnings around individual securities or management in general can in fact be accelerated if they were willing to just open the window just a tad you know they don't have to they don't have to blow the whole doors open and share the whole thing or sharing the secret sauce but I do believe that, you know, even by testing a few of your own personal conclusions or things like that, it, it forces a faster uh, learning cycle than if you didn't. Yeah, very well said. Well, Robert, you know, I think this is as good a place as any to, um, you know, hit pause. I thank you so much for the time, for coming back on. This has been everything I hoped it was going to be, which is just a fascinating conversation and a fascinating, I think, update on what you're building with Compound Kings. 
I hope to do this again in another year. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming back on. Hell yeah. I can't, can't wait to see where these stocks are 12 months from now. <laughs> and yeah, hopefully the, you know, the ride is maybe slightly less bumpy from here on out. Although I don't know <laughs> if that's going to be the case. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes and text transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 129. That's outlieracademy.com slash 129. And you can learn more about Compound Kings at kingsetf.com or by following Robert Cantwell at Upholdings on Twitter. At outlieracademy.com, you can find all of our other investor interviews profiling investment firms including Dry House Capital, NFX, Graycroft, Pantera Capital, Lightspeed, Foundation Capital, Moran Capital Management, and more. In every interview, we deconstruct the ideas, frameworks, and strategies they used to generate incredible returns and track records. You can find the videos of all of our interviews on YouTube at youtube.com slash outlieracademy. On our channel, you'll find all of our full-length interviews as well as our favorite short clips from every episode, including this one. So make sure to subscribe. We post new videos and clips every single week. And if you haven't already, make sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn at Outlier Academy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode next Wednesday.